Okay, thanks very much. So this is sort of part two. Uh, yesterday I talked about uh, how to decide how large to make a trial, and this is really advice as to what to do once you've got all the data in. Um, I felt a little bit guilty, or well, I always feel a bit guilty about putting formula and things up in my lectures because I know it turns a lot of people off. Um, but I was very gratified that at least one person used one of our formulae in the uh, phase two exercise yesterday. So, uh, Margarita, thank you very much indeed for encouraging me. But I'll, I will keep them to a minimum. So I'm going to talk about the statistical aspects. Um, I'm going to cover the consort guidelines. How many people have heard of consort? Most people. Very good. Um, about the formulation of a statistic analysis plan. Um, then the calculation of vaccine efficacy estimates and confidence intervals for simple trials based on both risks and, and rates. Um, the concept of a, a period at risk in a trial and variable follow-up time in, in, in trials. A little bit about the difference between intention to treat and per protocol analyses and when you might use one or the other um, or both. Uh, some of the dangers of subgroup analysis. Um, and then a little bit about adjusting for confounding in trials. So um, the consult guidelines, which many of you know about, were developed in the sort of late 1980s, early 1990s, really, but, and that was the time when people started doing meta-analysis, sort of putting together a lot of work on the same topic, often on, on treatments, but some on vaccines, um, to try and assess what the sort of overall effect of the um, uh, intervention was uh, combining the results from different trials. And what they found when they did this was the way they read the papers, there's a whole lot of information missing that they couldn't actually assess whether it was a good trial or a bad trial, how they'd randomized, if they'd randomized, and so on and so forth. And that made it very difficult to actually do these meta-analyses where the quality aspect of the trial is a, is a part of the evaluation. So they produced these guidelines. Um, They've updated them since then as a sort of checklist is this is what you should include if you're going to report on a trial. Um, and the really critical step that they made, and uh, it was very clever of them, was they went to the journals and said, look, we think your authors ought to adhere to these guidelines. And most of the major journals said, great, yeah, we'll insist on that. And so they then sent out these guidelines to the reviewers. And so if you submit to the major journals for the most part, you can rely on the fact that the reviewers will be looking to see have you actually followed these consort guidelines. So it actually makes writing a paper on a trial rather easy because once you follow all the guidelines, you've always written the paper. Um, and it's become a bit of an industry. Um, in, in, initially, it was for individually randomized trials, but they've now produced a whole lot of different guidelines. If you do a cluster randomized trial, a non-inferiority trial, uh, and so on, and so on. If you do what trials of Chinese herbal medicines, there's some guidelines as to what you should have in your paper about those, and also about um, uh, adverse effects as well. So uh, I'm not going to spend any time with this. I think there's a, uh, in your pack, in your references in, in Moodle, there's the, uh, a paper on this, but if you just put in consult into Google, you'll find, and you can click on whichever ones of these you want. One of the important things that they actually include in the guidelines is there should be a, 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 a flow diagram as to how the trial was designed. This is just one for a malaria, the artery assessed malaria vaccine trial, one of the early studies with that vaccine. And there, this flow diagram, which really tells you what happened all the way through the trial. How many people were actually screened for eligibility? Who was kicked out and why were they kicked out? Um, how many people got through to randomization, how they were randomized between, in this case, the millennial vaccine or control group, <clears throat> which was a two to one ratio here. And then as they went through the trial, how many actually got the second dose, the third dose or the first dose? And if they didn't get those doses, why didn't they get them? Um, right through to the analysis uh, where they you get how many people actually included in the analysis. This was a a per protocol analysis, as I'll come on later on. So it's a very good picture. This gives you a, a an image of what's actually happening happened in a trial. And again, most journals insist on that now. 
Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the st a statistical analysis plan. Um, this is should be de developed or finalized in advance of breaking the code. What used to happen is people broke the code, looked at the data, and then decided how they would analyze it. And um, there was an appreciation that might be biased in that you actually may actually pick results that look better than um, some other results. So that now there's a, a, a requirement in most major trials to actually have a statistical analysis plan where you actually write details of how you're going to anal analyze the data um, before you actually break the code. This is normally guided by what's in the protocol. The protocol for the trial would normally outline more or less what's going to happen with it with respect to analysis. But some of the details of that are often left to the, the statistical analysis plan before the code is broken. And that plan is generally approved by, if the trial's got a steering committee, by them, uh, often by the DSMB, and if it's a regulatory trial, by the regulatory agency. And in that uh, plan, there should be sort of unambiguous definitions of what the what the primary endpoint is, particularly important in regulatory trials, and what the secondary endpoints are, who's going to be excluded and who's going to be included in the analyses, uh, what are the entry and exit times for the start of the trial and the end of the trial, um, what methods of statistical analysis are going to be used in, in, in analyzing the trial, uh, any adjusted analyses that are going to be done, and any uh, criteria for these and any subgroup analysis that are going to be done, um, whether you're going to do it separately in males and females or, or so forth. Um, and what's good practice and is often done is to actually, once you've got all the results without the code having been broken, you just randomly assign people to the vaccine group or to the placebo group, irrespective of what they actually received. And you've written a, a program which will analyze the data according to the statistical analysis plan and produce the, the tables that you would expect to see when you actually analyze the final data. Um, and of course, because you've randomly assigned people irrespective of what they actually received, you wouldn't expect to see much in the way of significant differences between them, but it will show you what the tables look like. Um, and interestingly, sometimes you do get statistically significant effects, which you know are due to chance, um, but it just gets, uh, it's, which is a reminder that not everything that is significant is real. Um, but it's a very good practice to do that. And then when you break the code, um, which you shouldn't do until you've lodged the frozen data set with some suitable body, often the DSMB or maybe the regulatory agency, so they can, in theory at least, see if you've changed things once you've broken the code and um, it, sometimes it's necessary to do that, but then you have to justify why you've done that. Um, and then once you once you actually come to break the code, you press the button, run the same analysis, and you've more or less got all the tables that you want to write the paper. So you can write the paper within a within a week or two, uh, although it often takes a bit longer for pa papers to come out, unfortunately. Um, so that's the statistical analysis plan, a very crucial part of trials. So how do you analyze a, a simple trial? So this is a, a, a very simple trial. You've got a certain number of people who are randomized to control, a certain number of people are randomized to vaccinated. You follow them for some divine length of time, and you count how many cases of disease were in the, it occurred in the follow-up period in the vaccine group and in the placebo group. You calculate the risk of disease in the, in the two groups, and you can calculate your vaccine efficacy in the normal way. Um, and then you can actually calculate confidence intervals on that estimate of vaccine efficacy very simply. Um, it's usual to take to work in logarithms, logarithms here in the analysis. The reason for that simply is in in, in a, a, a relative risk can essentially go between zero and one, or one and to infinity. Um, whereas if you take logarithms, the distance between zero and one and one and infinity is the same. So that's a, a, an off-the-cup explanation of why we take logarithms. But, um, so I'm not going to go through these formula, but all I'm going to say about the formula is they are simple. You just manipulate these numbers so you can do it. I used to say on, on, on 
your hand calculator. I don't think anybody has hand calculators anymore, but you can do it on your phone. Um, and then you can get 95 confidence limits on that on the relative risk and convert that to the uh, 90, to to, vac, uh, to to limits on the vaccine efficacy. So in a simple trial, 50 cases in the control group, 30 in the vaccinated group, vaccine efficacy 40 percent. And if you just chug through the formula, you come through and get a, a vaccine efficacy, uh, uh, a confidence interval from 26 to 50. 51 there. So it's very simple to do that you can do that on any paper and you don't need sophisticated um, methods. Actually, you can do it even easier. Um, how many of you are familiar with OpenEpi? Okay, not so many. I suggest you look at OpenEpi. If you just put OpenEpi in Google, you'll find it. Um, and it's, a, it's a, a, an open source uh, program, essentially, which enables you to do many of the things. It was the same, developed by the same people who developed EpiInfo, I think, at the CDC in Atlanta. Um, and basically, it enables you to do a whole lot of things very easily. And in particular, in terms of this discussion, the sort of two-by-two two table that I've just been talking about, you just click on that, put the numbers in, and it will give you the risks and the confidence intervals. And you can do that for rates as well as uh, Numbers such as like a simple two by two table and the way I'm going to describe in a minute. And it will also do the sort of sample size calculations I talked about yesterday. Um, it's totally free. And, uh, the other thing that's important about it is that, um, if you, um, don't have internet access, you've still got no excuse for using it because you can download it and keep it on your computer. Um, I'm not sure you can keep it on your phone, but at least on your computer. Um, okay. So that, Example to start with was a sort of hypothetical example. Real life is more complicated than that. You can't enter all people on the same day, follow them for exactly the same amount of time, and then do that sort of simple analysis. But basically, when you do a vaccine trial, um, it takes time to actually recruit people into the population. It may take weeks, months, sometimes years. And so people enter the trial at different times. Um, oops, sorry. At different times um and then you follow them and various things happen to them along the way um they may actually develop the disease that you're interested in they may die either from the disease you're interested in or for something else you may lose them to follow up and so on and so forth and really the analysis is based upon taking account of the different follow-up time of the different individuals in the trial in, in, the, in the in the trial and you've obviously got a as it were, a picture like this for the vaccine group and a picture like this for the control group. Normally, you want to define a uh, an end date uh, for the trial, but, and then you don't you shouldn't include events that occur after the end date for fairly obvious reasons. So, what happens in a sort of typical vaccine trial? Uh, and a participant in the trial gets born at some point. Um, and they get recruited into the trial, and they're randomized to, let's say it's simply to vaccine or placebo, um, and they get their first dose. Um, and then they get their second dose at some second time, and this is, again, vaccine or placebo, they get their third dose. And then they're all followed up to some period, at end of follow-up, the end of the follow-up, the end of the follow-up date. And then in between times, they may die, they may migrate, or they may just get lost. or they may actually develop the target disease that we're most interested in. So those are the sort of critical events in a trial, if it's, this is a sort of three-dose vaccine. So we can do two sorts of analyses. We can enter from the time of randomization, or usually the time of receiving the first dose, sometimes an interval between the randomization and receiving the first dose, That's uh, and sometimes that's... Uh, uh, called a modified intention to treat, so you exclude those people who were supposed to enter the trial, randomized, but for some other reason they didn't turn up, so they didn't get any doses. So um, uh, so a modified intention to treat really starts at the first dose, and the and then you analyze everything that happens after that time. Now the problem with that analysis is that some would say, well, you're actually analyzing 
differences between vaccine and placebo at a time when you wouldn't expect there to be any differences between the two groups. That here, you know, and dose one, you have a case on day after dose one, you can hardly say that's uh, something that you'd expect to prevent by the vaccine, for most vaccines anyway. Um, so um, the, the other way of analyzing the data, other than that, is to do a so-called per protocol analysis, which is to wait until individuals have had all three doses, then wait a time until the immune response after the third dose has, has, has reached a level that you think is going to be protective, typically 14 days, say, and then you analyze only events that occur after that. Um, and you might further qualify it that, uh, well, what about people who have didn't get the second or third dose? Well, you don't include those. They're not in, they're not per protocol. Is the interval between the first and second or the second and third dose different from what it's specified in the protocol? Normally you put a range. If it's might be outside of that range, then you exclude those two. So, um, the per protocol is a, is a reduced set of individuals who have got all three doses, have been followed up, up to 14 days, let's say after dose three, and then you look at the disease events that occur after that. Now, this is um, the most unbiased analysis is this one, because it respects the randomization. You get different dropout in this by the time you get to here, and you don't really know what effect that might have. For example, if the vaccine is very reactogenic and people say they've had one dose and they say, well, that's enough. I'm not going to come back. That won't happen in the placebo group. So you get an imbalance between the two groups. And if that's in any way related to the risk of subsequently getting the, the target disease, then you may have an imbalance between the groups in, in um, the, 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 the protocol analysis. I think that's more a, a theoretical than a, a real difference generally. But it is one that um, uh, is why uh, regulators and most of us like to see both of these analyses done, just to make sure there's not a, you see a big difference between this analysis and this analysis, that sort of rings bells that there's something something odd here. Um, so that, I think I've just said all that. Um, I can go more quickly. Yep. Um, so ideally, when you do this, both both kinds of analysis give give similar results, um, and um, there are possib possibilities of, of bias. So what, this is just an example. This is the the Moderna uh, COVID vaccine. Their their per protocol analysis was um, was fourteen days after the second dose. So this shows the uh, analysis. So they excluded everything that occurred here. And they only started counting COVID cases from day, whatever it is, 42 onwards. Um, and they got a vaccine efficacy of 94%. Um, but they also did a modified intention to treat. So they included people uh, as soon as they got the first dose. Not really expecting to see much protection, I think, uh, in the early part. But as it turned out, uh, protection actually started to occur quite early. So between the the first and second dose, there was still quite a lot of protection. And if you, they did the vaccine analysis, the efficacy analysis on that, it was 93%. So they're not very much difference. And I think that's, that's typical. The only, the only time when you might worry that they're not going to be similar is if that interval is very long. If you've got a long spacing out between the doses, then a lot of cases could occur uh, at a time when you don't expect the vaccine to be fully effective. Um, I'm not sure whether I include the example, but that was, well, I'll come back to it in a minute. So this, what you actually get now in, in terms of analyzing it, a trial like that, is you've got the number of people in each group, and then you've got a person time of follow-up, which is adding up all those little times for each individual in each of the groups. And then you count the number of cases of disease that occur, and you now calculate rate of disease, which is simply the, the number of cases occurred uh, in the cumulative person time of follow-up by adding up all those little bits. And then you can calculate the vaccine efficacy in the same way, and you can actually uh, calculate the, uh, the uh, 
confidence interval on the log of the relative risk very simply just by using those C naught and C1 numbers. Um, so um, this was um, a different COVID vaccine. This was the, uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, the trial that was done from out of Oxford. Um, there they had about 7,000 people in each group. Uh, I haven't put the person time of follow up, but they had uh, 74 cases in the vaccinated group and 197 in the placebo group. And you could calculate the risk of disease there. And then you can calculate the vaccine efficacy in the normal way. And uh, you can go through all those formulae, which one person might be inclined to do later on, but we'll see. Um, you can actually calculate what the confidence intervals using that very simple formula. Um, However, when they published the paper, um, the 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 um, the estimate that um, they got um, using robust cross and models adjusting for study and age group, da -da 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 -da, so doing quite a lot of adjustment and with an offset for length of time at risk, um, they got an estimate of sixty three point one instead of sixty three. Well, I. I think 63 is probably good enough. So uh, generally, simple. My, I, I think my main message is in a good trial, simple analyses will get you the answer. And you don't need, or, uh, people do all of this adjustment just to be sure there's not something going on. But if it's a good trial, there shouldn't be something else going on. So um, you can do it all with um, open epi or on the back of an envelope. And that's, I'm not going to go through, but that's it. That's the formula just to do, go through uh, how we did it. The other thing I want to caution about is subgroup analysis in, in trials. It's very tempting to actually, once you've done the trial, you've got your primary endpoint, and then you actually start to look, well, maybe the efficacy is different in one group or another group. So, for example, in the pneumococcal vaccine trial that I talked about yesterday, it was done in Gambia. Um, Gambia is a, a country where there's quite a pronounced dry and a rainy season. And the rainy season is when most of the malaria occurs. And there was a hypothesis that maybe this vaccine doesn't work as well if people might have malaria at the same time as it works if it's in the dry season where we wouldn't have malaria. So they did these analyses and so they broke it down as whether people got all their doses in the rainy season, all their doses in the dry season, or some of the rainy and some of the dry season. And they saw quite striking differences here. The rainy season, 8% vaccine efficacy, obviously not significant. In the dry season, 35% uh, and um, significant, just. Um, and in the mixed, it was 45% and, and quite significant. Um, now, before you get too carried away with these analyses, the important thing to say is just because it's significant in one and not in another, doesn't mean that there's necessarily a difference. The first thing to do is actually to do what's called a heterogeneity test, saying if there really was no difference in the vaccine efficacy between these with the three groups, how likely is it that we might see a result such as the one that we've seen or something more extreme than that? So you can do this heterogeneity test, which is, a, again, a fairly simple test. And if you do that, you get a p-value of about 10%. So it's not unlikely to have occurred by chance. Um, so doing those heterogeneity tests is important um, before you go overboard in, in interpreting this. Um, so it, it raises a hypothesis that somebody might, to, might want to follow up later, but the evidence from the trial that there are these differences is really, is really not all that compelling. Um, a more recent example is this is the, uh, the safety signal from the uh, GSK malaria RSV vaccine, which they've now stopped development because of this safety signal. Um, and what they found was that it was a large trial, um, two to one randomization. They had uh, three, th three and a half thousand women got the vaccine. Half that number got the placebo and they wanted to look at the occurrence of uh, RSV in the infant in the next six months or one year. But what they found was that it was an excess of premature births um, in the vaccine group. So 6.8% 6, 6 compared to only 4.9% and quite highly statistically significant. 
Um, and that was, and they really didn't come up, well, they haven't yet come up with any very satisfactory explanation as to why that occurred. But it was a sufficiently uh, concerning apparent adverse effect for them to stop developing the vaccine. Um, they've done a number of analyses of that. Most of them are, I think they are, none of them I think are yet published. But they are in the public domain, and I've given a reference to you, anybody who wants to follow it up. There's a, a YouTube video of a conference at which they presented these in, in Lisbon a, a month or two ago. And one of the analyses they did, they, they, it was a multi-centered trial, and they had um, sites in low- and middle-income countries and sites in high-income countries. And they did this uh, analysis separating low- and middle-income and high-income and looked to see if there was a difference. Um, and there was a there was a difference in prematurity rates in the two countries, but the excess uh, of the uh, premature births in the vaccine in the vaccine group compared to placebo seemed to be confined to the middle income countries. So it was only um, you know, a relative risk of 1.6 compared to about one in high income countries. So that and that was highly significant and that was not significant. But then if you actually apply this guidance that I've suggested that you actually have to do a heterogeneity test is that if there really was no difference between these relative risks, uh, how likely is that you might see uh, a, a difference as extreme or more extreme than this? And if you do that, you come up with a, a p-value of about 17%. So again, it's not anything that actually is really, um, I think this, this wasn't a planned analysis. It was obviously exploratory. It raises a hypothesis but the evidence that actually there is this big difference between low and middle income countries and high income countries uh, is not all that compelling to my mind at the moment, but it does raise the hypothesis. And they did various other analyses looking at um, uh, different time intervals. They showed differences between different time intervals and they showed differences as to whether uh, women got uh, uh, another vaccine as well as the RSV vaccine in pregnancy or not. And they showed some striking differences there too. But none of those actually uh, met this test for heterogeneity. So they're, they're hypothesis generating, if you like, but uh, they should be regarded as no more than that. Um, so in terms of adjusting for potential confounding variables, um, if you've done a large randomized trial, then there shouldn't really be any confounding because that's what randomization is all about. So that um, any confounders should be equal or potential confounders should be equally distributed between the vaccine and placebo group. Both the ones you know about, um, uh, like age or, or, or gender, uh, but also the ones you don't know about, which you, 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 you may not even be able to measure. Um, so in large trials, I'd say don't bother doing this. I mean, that's what they did in the Oxford trial that I mentioned, adjusted for all these things. It made no difference. And generally, it should not make no difference. In smaller trials, there may by chance be a difference between the two groups with respect to no confounding factors. Um, and you obviously, the possibility then is you won't know if there are differences in unknown confounding factors. That's going to be unknown because you haven't measured them. But anyway, if you, you can adjust for the known ones um, and see if it makes any difference. But in, in general, in large trials, it's... it's um, it's it's not worth doing it. well. It's not worth doing it, but it's unlikely to make any difference. Um, but the important thing is that if you're going to do these sort of adjustments, you should specify in the statistical analysis plan which things you're going to adjust for um, and why you're going to adjust for them. Because there's a danger too that you know if you've got a, a non-sequent result and you keep sort of adjusting for this and adjusting for that, if you do if you're creative enough, you might be able to squeeze a, a result out which um, uh, wasn't planned. So if you get marked differences between the adjusted and unadjusted analyses, um, I think that that uh, raises issues about the credibility of the trial results. Um, I've given a few references there. Um, and then I'll finish as I did yesterday with a commercial. Um, uh, by the end of this course, you'll be all coursed out. So I don't think this applies to any of you, um, but it may apply to some of your colleagues. We run a, a, a much more focused course at the London School for two weeks later in the year, just on the 
epidemiology evaluation of vaccines and safety and policy. Um, that's the sort of contents. And if any of your colleagues would like to come, we can't quite offer you the surroundings in London that you've got here, um, but there's more alternative things to do if you don't actually want to come to our lectures. Um, so I'll finish there. Thank you. You're quite a salesman, Peter. You're quite a salesman. Um, thanks. Thanks so very much. Um, any questions? Yes. And then, yeah. uh, please, could you uh, precise if heterogeneity test is similar to a sensitivity test? Because sometimes we need in the, our analysis plan to show at the end of our analysis, even we made uh, like adjustment or stratification, the sensitivity uh, test. So if, if uh, they are distinct, uh, what is the difference? If they are similar, maybe it's only about the traduction. And also when we should do sensitivity test, what we, should we include uh, to test the sensitivity? Uh, it's a variable who had like a clinical implication, public health implication, which kind of uh, variable should we include then? Thank you. Yeah, I don't think I can answer that because I'm not, I don't think I know what a sensitivity test is. Ah, okay. If it's the same as a, Heterogeneity test, then I can answer that. Uh, but, uh, but it should... um, well, maybe I can give you an example. Uh, like, uh, sorry, I evaluate an antigen test, okay? And uh, uh, I evaluate the concordance of two uh, different uh, antigen tests, okay? And then they ask me to uh, make the sensitivity test to see if the, uh, the concordance is still similar. Diagnostic yeah, yeah. And then yeah. I, 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 I may answer. It's uh, because ah. in French we use different words, but those are two different tests to respond to your questions. Perhaps we can discuss afterwards. It's a similar question that we talk about uh, credibility intervals and confidence intervals. What What is the difference there? Credibility intervals are often used in, in what... Uh, a sort of Bayesian analyses where assumptions are made before you start as to what you, is a plausible range for the um, the the efficacy, um, and generally, um, in most trials, I think when people analyse things in that way, you get something very similar between credibility and um, and, and, and 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 confidence intervals. Yeah. Hi, thank you for a great presentation. And this is from South Africa. I just want to know if there is a standard formula, you know, a standard rule of thumb to determine, to distinguish between a wide and a narrow confidence interval, or does that vary across studies? Thanks. Well, in, in terms of the sort of general guidance, um, a, a, a wide one is if it crosses zero, and a narrow one is if it doesn't cross zero, or in the more uh, specific ones, where if you were seeking to license a vaccine, a wide one, too wide one, will be one which crosses the lower confidence bound where you said. You remember we said we think this vaccine efficacy will be 70% efficacy, and we want to be sure that, or reasonably sure that it, uh, the true efficacy, the lower confidence bound is going to be greater than, let's say, 30%. So if the wide one is, is um, it crosses that, then... Uh, basically, you won't be able to license your vaccine. So, but but in terms of, um, I don't think there's a general. I mean, that may not be answer the question, but I'm not sure there's a general answer. To, it's a little bit like how long is a piece of string. Okay. Any further questions? Yes. This is also perhaps linking a bit with mixed talk, but if, say, in your protocol you specified you would link to other databases, perhaps to find additional outcomes. Um, and you did find whether that's say like HIV diagnoses or something, um, at what point would you incorporate them into your analysis and how would you best do that? If they're not part of the trial, say people who were lost to follow up or yet yeah, you found extra events that you didn't otherwise collect within your trial. You mean if you actually find when you come to analyze the data, the things that you want to take account of that you didn't take account of in your statistical analysis plan? No, if you had the data set already, but you also said you would link to other, say, like national registries, hospital registries, and you found extra outcomes, yes, that you hadn't previously collected. 
Yeah, I mean, that should all be specified in your statistical analysis plan. I mean, either you're going to do that or not. I mean, generally, you, you don't do that. You rely on other mechanisms to pick up cases, but some, some in, 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 sometimes you might use that in some, some sorts of trial. Um, but that, again, should be decided in advance. If you suddenly discover a source of cases that you didn't know about at the time you wrote the statistical analysis plan, then it's okay to include that in the analysis, but you have to say when you write it up, we didn't include this in our statistical analysis plan, and when we include these, it makes this or that difference. And then, I mean, obviously, if you turn a, a non-significant result into a significant result by including these additional cases, people might be a little bit uh, less enthusiastic about your result than if you hadn't uh, if you hadn't done that. What if uh, what if the intention to treat analysis and per protocol gives you different results? What what does uh, if when you do uh, when you do the analysis and come and you see that the intention to treat results differ from uh, per protocol? Well, generally, if if they differ, uh, unless there are good reasons for them to differ, I thought I had in a slide, but I forgot to put it in. But I think I showed it yesterday um, that in the if you've got a long interval, if you've got a long interval between doses, like and the example I was going to use is the Sanofi dengue vaccine, where it's a three dose vaccine, zero, six months and 12 years. And, they're, and, they're, and their original plan was to follow up for a year after that to get their primary analysis. So their per protocol analysis was going to be from the end of year one up to uh, sorry, from year one up until the end of year one, so a year after they'd given all the doses. Um, and so that was their per protocol analysis. But they also did an intention to treat analysis where they analyzed all of the cases from the time of the first dose. Now, they actually didn't expect to be as good protection from the first dose as after the third dose. Otherwise, they wouldn't have designed it as a 0 6 12, uh, vaccine. Um, but somewhat to their surprise, I think, when they did the intention to treat analysis, they found more or less the same result as in their per protocol analysis. So at a time when people were not hadn't received their second and their third doses, there was still a difference in the dengue rates between the two groups. So that there, you know, it went the other way, that um, they didn't expect uh, those two to be the same. If you do, if you do get this, uh, and that they, they sort of have to explain that, well, maybe the they didn't need all three doses, or maybe they did need three doses, but it wasn't going to become apparent until years two, three, four. But there's uh, other things that went on with that vaccine, as, as some of you know. Um, but generally, I think you, you're obliged to... I, I, I can't think of many examples where there's a difference between the intention to treat and the, um, the per protocol analysis. So although generally journals, regulators will require you to do both, um, if you do find a difference, um, then you've got to sort of seek some explanation for that. And that will obviously depend upon the specific circumstances of the trial. Hi. Um, when you're doing non-inferiority analysis, uh, is there a general acceptable lower bound for the confidence interval, or is it dependent on the vaccine and your agreement with the agency? Yeah, yeah, well, it's really sort of set by the regulatory agency, and they will actually tell you what it should be, um, whether that's in terms of the uh, percent of people who have, we, we, if we're talking about conversion, as I said yesterday, it's very uncommon to do a non-inferiority study where you've got a clinical endpoint. But they would not, not and, they, and that by may be set either in terms of the conversion rate um, between the, the, the vaccine and the competitor vaccine, or in terms of, or generally also in terms of the geometric mean t titer induced by the new vaccine. And, and they, and that generally for the GMT, I think it's usually about 0.67%. That's 0.67 ratio rather. Um, but that is set essentially by the regulators. And that's a discussion you have to have with the regulators of what's going to be regarded as non-inferior because, um, um, you know, it's, 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 you'd really like that to be as small as possible. Uh, 
the non-inferiority margin. You don't want something that might be inferior, but at the same time, the smaller you make that interval, the larger study you're going to have to do in it to, to, to actually satisfy the criteria. Hi, Helen from Sweden. Uh, just a related question. If uh, regulatory agencies have any um, lower limits for how bad a vaccine uh, or how good it has to be. Uh, that is, if it's only 30% effective and the company wants to proceed. Well, uh, uh, regulators can correct me uh, later, but my understanding is that if the the benefits clearly outweigh the risks, then they will license a vaccine. And that's a very different question from what vaccine efficacy is going to be sufficient for a vaccination program to introduce the vaccine. So the, the bar for what regulators will accept in terms of licensing a product is generally lower um, than the bar that might be required to introduce that vaccine into public health use. Um, and that's, you know, that's that's reasonable because the circumstances, like, like, like for example, with the malaria vaccine, which got 30% efficacy, you know, regulators aren't so used to looking at uh, uh, vaccines with efficacy is that low, but when you actually translate that into what of impact that might have in terms of malaria in the field, that's a sufficiently good uh, effect to make that vaccine cost effective. And people have argued in the same way for, for HIV vaccines and, and TB vaccines, which they may only appear to have modest efficacy, but they will have a, a big effect. And there's, a, there's an example um, in the exercise you're going to do the, after like, about the the um, the um, rotavirus vaccine trial that was done in South Africa, Malawi, where in Malawi they actually found the the efficacy was just about significantly lower than the efficacy in South Africa. But when they translated that into the effect that the introduction of that vaccine was going to have in terms of rotavirus disease, because rotavirus disease was so much higher in Malawi, then that lower efficacy would actually translate into a bigger population effect than the effect in South Africa. And those are the sort of issues that regulate, uh, that, that vaccinate take account of. And actually, with the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, we have the very same thing. If you look into on how much it prevents uh, pneumococcal pneumonia or pneumonia in general, it was like 25%. But actually, the uh, prevention of the burden is, is huge when, when it uh, you start calculating the actual numbers that you can prevent. Yeah, and then that was the sort of justification for the the Gambia. I mean, the 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 pneumococcal vaccines were originally licensed on the basis of prevention of invasive disease due to pneumococcus, and generally it's very difficult to determine what is causing pneumonia. So the trial was done to see, and there was a, a suspicion that actually quite a lot of pneumonia in the Gambia might actually be due to pneumococcus, and as you saw, it, it was a 40% reduction in, in X-ray pneumonia. But that was really, you know, actually measuring that trial, what the effect on invasive due, disease due to pneumococcus was, was sort of irrelevant in, in terms of um, the public health impact. The public health impact on pneumonia was really much greater. Let's take three last questions and then we go into the groups. Yeah, thanks, uh, Emmanuel. Uh, a short one. Um, so when you design a protocol, so you have the data analysis plan, which you also agree on uh, beforehand, and then you submit the ethics and all that. So you have uh, you 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 agree on the variables that you are going to analyze. So I'm just wondering if then at the end of the trial, you actually uh, do more analysis beyond what you had planned to do, whether that wouldn't be seen as bias or not, uh, because there are many ways you can twist your data. Doctor, look good. Yeah, I mean, in some respects, you know, if you've spent, I don't know, fifty, hundred million dollars on doing a trial just to actually run it through the the analysis plan and not do any further analysis of the data, it does seem a little bit um, uh, non-efficient. Um, I think what it was, and, and clearly, I mean, the example I gave in the Newbercock, I don't think that whether it was in the rainy season or in, in the in the in the dry season was in the analysis plan, it was an afterthought. And they did that, and it raised a hypothesis. Um, so I think it's worth exploring the data, but you have to mm -hmm. make it clear that this wasn't in the 
analysis plan. It was an afterthought, exploratory afterthought. To, to, it may raise a few hypotheses, but it won't generally be regarded to to prove anything, unless, of course, you find something which is really, really extreme. Yeah, we can. I, I don't know whether, you know, this is a question that we can debate here now, but for case-driven studies where you plan interim analysis, are there any pitfalls, any recommendations that you could give, like, in terms of when to schedule the first interim analysis, how many, um, you know, so that you have a good idea of what's going on, but also don't, you know, don't overdo it. In yeah, I mean, analysis. one, you might decide not to do any interim analyses. You might just go on until you've got that number of cases. Uh, the danger of that, well, two dangers. One is if the vaccine is much more effective than you thought it was going to be, then you're actually going on for much longer than you needed to go on before you actually got an effective product. On the other hand, if the vaccine is much worse than you thought it was going to be and you're doing interim analysis and there's nothing going on, you might decide that um, you don't want to continue with this trial because there's really no evidence it's doing anything. So it's it's you don't want to do too many interim analyses um, uh, in general. There are some exceptions to that. In general, you don't want to do them. And, you know, if you do one when you're about halfway through and in terms of the case case numbers and then, then towards the end, I mean, that's... Pretty, I don't think there's any defined rules on that. It varies from trial to trial, but that seems to me an unreasonable approach. But you have to define why you're going to do the interim analyses. I mean, you're, you're, um, and, the, and the advantage of not doing them, um, I mean, the advantage, often the interim analyses are just done by the DSMB, and they are set fairly clear rules as you're only to advise us to change this trial if you've got results in that interim analysis which are sort of beyond a certain range. Uh, otherwise, the DSMB will just say, go on. We're not going to tell you what the result is. Um, and and um, to the investigators. And and that, I think, is generally how interim analyses work because otherwise, if investigators begin to suspect there's a um, an effect and it's difficult to keep those, result, those results actually secret, and it causes all sorts of problems. So generally, it's not not um, a, with the population in the trial, and not least. Um, so it's generally advisable to make those interim analyses public and to have very well defined rules as to what the uh, stopping rules are going to be in the trial. If you do an interim analysis, either stopping for overwhelming efficacy or stopping for so-called futility, because it's not 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 working. Um, I, I have a quick question that between intention to treat analysis is key randomization. However, per protocol is like actual intervention. Are there any rules that which one should be uh, generally be a primary endpoint or it's depend on the study design that we can define which one would be primary endpoint? You mean the, whether intention to treat or per protocol? Yes. yes. Um, I think most investigators would choose per protocol. protocol. Yeah, because, but regulatory. And most companies, I think, would prefer per protocol because that that's when you really expect yeah. to see the effect. And so that's often, I think, chosen as the, the primary analysis, although these things hopefully have to be negotiated with regulators. But I think most regulators will insist that even if you've got the per protocol as the primary analysis, you must do the intention to treat analysis. And then if you get a difference there, uh, which you don't very often do, but if you do, then there's, that raises some questions that have to be addressed. So I think, in general, I think um, a, a per, in, certainly in a sort of licensing trial, a per protocol analysis. If, if you're if you're in a, in a phase four study post licensure, and you're really wanted to evaluate what the impact of introducing this vaccine is in the population then the intention to treat probably becomes the more important one because, you know, if people get disease between getting the first dose and the third dose, then, you know, that's the vaccine isn't helping with that. Um, and it, it's a burden on the population. So the very, very last thing. Mm. Regarding the intermediate analysis, uh, usually it's the ethical committee who uh, oblige 
the, the investigator to make them and uh, he watched that really carefully and uh, sometimes when you are monitoring your study and you feel that something is going wrong usually you you uh, your protocol you pay, uh, put uh, like an amendment and then you see uh, how to do it i, I think it's uh, like an ethical issue and uh, very important uh, when you run your studies uh, abroad and uh, there is no pi there and only a master student is watching that uh, Okay, it's, it's, it was a point, but the other point I wanted to point out, usually we accept 5% uh, error. Should not we, uh, like, uh, it's not possible, and we admit it as, like, something uh, natural, could not be a, a low... Uh, uh, lower, lower, you know, come on, dear. Yeah, no, no, it's so, fine. Well, uh, voilà, uh, less one one percent risk. Can we? It's yeah, but you saw the consequences of that in my first lecture. Uh, okay, if, you, okay, okay. if you're prepared to pay the money to get that extra number of cases. And okay. that's to some extent the reason why you set a lower confidence bound on the efficacy and you don't have that as zero. Because, you know, if it's if you set it as 30%, okay, so maybe if you'd used um, a more stringent significance test, it would have been a bit wider. But, but it... it it, you're well away from zero. I think that's the important uh, thing of that lower confidence bound, that you're, you're pretty sure that this vaccine actually is doing something worthwhile. But, but you know, if you can use 0.01 and you can use 95% power and you've got a lot of money, then that's fine. <laughs> Sounds like we're not quite there oftentimes. Um, thank you so very much, Peter. And, and those of you who are with Peter's group, do enjoy uh, your jewel. Uh, and, and the rest of us uh, try to uh, um, get along with the facilitators that we have. <laughs> the the uh, uh, room allocations are there. Peter, you are in, in this room uh, okay. uh, with your group. And uh, the rest of us will uh, do some field epidemiology on finding our places. Do enjoy the exercise. And just to warn you, in the you look at the Bynes paper, which is some of you may have read, uh, they actually don't use 0 0.05, they use 0 0.1. Um, which is sort of stretching things a bit. <laughs>